In 1980, Juliet Butler studied at Exeter University and qualified with a degree in Russian. In 1982, age 23, she decided her future lay in Russia. I was always interested in Russia and I wanted to go there, but that was time of the Soviet Union, so it was really hard to uh, get past the Iron Curtain. The only way at that time for me to get to Russia was to be a nanny in the British Embassy. I managed to get a job, went over there, met a Russian Soviet citizen, fell in love, wanted to get married, but the British Embassy obviously didn't like that. They, they, they insisted that he was working for the KGB. So I was, uh, I had to leave my job there. Stayed in Russia for the next 20 years because he wasn't allowed out of the country. Juliet became a freelance journalist and interpreter. One day she happened to see Masha and Dasha Krivoslapova, conjoined female twins, appearing on a Russian TV show. And I was really fascinated because there are so few pairs of adult conjoined twins in the world. And they're very unusual in that they were joined at the waist. So they're, they're two people, you might say, from the waist up and one from the waist down because they had one leg each. Um, and they were able to walk, you know, unaided and the, the pretty amazing too. Um, Dasha did most of the talking and then I wanted to meet them. So I got in touch with the show and the uh, and, and they and I got in touch with the twins and they were staying in a dental institute and so I went off there and I was a bit nervous and, and the woman who was taking me up to see them she said oh you know a lot of people just faint when they see them because it's like so horrific so be warned and I was like oh I'm sure I'll be all right uh, but they were they were amazing they really put me at my ease as soon as you walk in you know, there's these two voices, and one of them is saying, do you want a cup of tea? And the other one's saying, I'll make you a cup of tea. And they're pottering around with kettles and things and asking me about England. And then quite soon, you just, it's, it's amazing, really, really soon, you just forget that they're conjoined at all. On a frozen January morning in 1950, the Siamese twins, Masha and Dasha, were born. The mum, um, she didn't know she was having twins. She'd never been to the doctor throughout the pregnancy. She was quite old, I think she was 38. But she just took it all for, you know, pregnancy, took it for granted. She was a working class woman. She worked on the factory floor in Moscow. Um, and then when she started having contractions, she walked through this blizzard, a snowstorm. A neighbor took her to the hospital. And of course, then she had huge problems having the babies. Of course, they didn't know they were conjoined. And then once she'd had them, the doctors were just like, you've had a freak, a monster, and took them away. But uh, her maternal instincts kicked in and she just wanted to see them and breastfeed them and she wouldn't give them up. So the mother refused to sign this order saying that she would reject them, saying that she wanted to come and see them wherever they were kept, that she still wanted to visit them. And she would have done, she would have been a lovely mother to them. But they didn't want that because they knew what they were going to do to the twins. No mother would be able to accept or watch or agree to because it was essentially medical torture. So they told her that the twins had died of pneumonia so that um, she'd forget about them. Meanwhile, they didn't have to bother about the dad because he'd been brought in to see them and they were naked on a slab and obviously it was a shock to him and he immediately said, I don't want my name on the birth certificate, I don't want anything to do with them, they're not mine. So he never talked to his wife about them again. Masha and Dasha were the most extreme form of Siamese twins, known as Decaphalus tetrabrachius tripus. They were born with two heads, four arms, two trunks and three legs. They each had one leg and another at the back, the third leg, which was removed in 1968. The twins were regarded as perfect for human experiments as they each had their own nervous system but shared the same blood supply. Anokin, a Russian physiologist, carried out a number of experiments on the twins from birth until they were six. They deprived them one at a time of sleep for long periods as babies, so they'd just keep them awake all the time to see what effect that had on the other one. They would freeze one in ice, bring the body temperature right down to almost fatal levels to see what happened to the other twin. 
They'd starve one. They'd have food tubes put down them the whole time, measuring tubes. They'd have encephalograms, which is like helmets, measuring their brain. They were given electric shocks to see what their reaction would be. A metronome would tick. And then um, when the metronome started ticking, they knew they were going to get an electric shock. So they wanted to judge. It was Pavlovian. They wanted to judge. Because it's a little known fact that Pavlov used to give electric shocks, not just to dogs, but to orphans. They were treated like guinea pigs. They lay in a cot in a locked room. Their only visitors were hospital staff and scientists who often wore masks. At six, this, the scientists didn't really have anything more to study. So they sent them to uh, in, uh, an orthopaedic hospital to be taught to walk. Looked after completely differently there by the nurses, especially one, their physiotherapist, Auntie Nadia, who uh, adored them and fell in love with them, really, and became their surrogate mother throughout their life. They were kept isolated until they were 11, and then they were allowed outside to walk, because Masha was really, really naughty. People passing saw them, and, this, the, and, and there was, like, shock went right through Moscow that there's this girl with two heads. And ever since that time, there were crowds around the hospital grounds the whole time. And so by the time they were 14, this had got to such a state, you know, the gossip about them, that they, uh, the authorities decided to move them down to a school in Novichokovsk, which is in southern Russia. It was a boarding school for severely disabled students. The teachers and pupils were kind, and these were the happiest days of their lives. Auntie Nadia came from Moscow to visit them. So at the age of 14, I suppose it must have been, when they were at school, um, and Dasha and Masha were going through puberty, and I think that Masha decided she wanted to look like a boy. She was going to be butch, basically. Because she was, she was going to make sure that Dasha was as well. So she wanted Dasha to look exactly like she did, which meant that when Masha cut her hair, Dasha had to cut her hair short too. Masha wore men's clothes, Dasha had to wear men's clothes and men's boots and trousers, and there was nothing Dasha could do about that. The twins were very different in character. Masha was controlling and bullying, hitting Dasha, who was kind and submissive. Dasha was very romantic, she always was. And, and as a girl, she, she fell very much in love with one of the boys in the school. She was in love with Gagarin, and um, in a way, they idealised Stalin when they were little. So she, she was always a hero worshipper. But, um, you know, Ma Masha essentially was a lesbian, and she wanted a reflection of that in her sister, even though Tasha was very romantic. Masha hated that in her. They were 18 years old when they left school and um, just a year before they were due to graduate but they'd realised that they weren't going to be able to get a job in society, that they were going to be sent to an old people's home. And so they went back to Moscow and they were put in this massive old people's home and they were the only young people there. There were no homes for invalids because there were no invalids in, in the Soviet Union because there were no floors and you couldn't have conjoined twins running around in the Soviet Union. That was the biggest floor of all. So, yeah, that was it. 18 years old, taken to a little room, tiny little room, tiny little to toilet, and told, uh, you can sit here and do nothing else for the rest of your life. The twins were constantly moved from one old people's home to another. They were not given a chance to develop their skills. They made a small income from limited work sewing nappies and finishing off pipettes for laboratories. Juliet was the only journalist allowed access to the twins. Well, they'd never met any Westerners before, so there was that. They were interested to hear, you know, had I met the Queen type thing. And uh, they wanted to hear all about Princess Diana. But with Masha, mostly it was just because uh, in those days there was a lot of shortages of food and, and, and goods and products. And Westerners could get them through a special chain of shops, Gariozka shops. So I could bring Masha and Dasha things from those shops. So for Masha, that was the reason, mainly. And for Dasha, she just, um, 
it was a, it was a breath of fresh air. I think meeting someone from another country who she'd always wanted to go abroad and see the world, and she was very interesting and inquir. She had a really inquiring mind. Um, so she she talked all the time to me. She loved asking me, you know, what books I was reading, what, what films I w enjoyed, what what living in England was like, what the houses were like. So she she was just interested. And I, I was interested in her because, you know, I, I'm, I was quite interested in the whole abusive relationship thing and I did feel sorry for her. She didn't have many friends. Juliet included the girls in her family life. The twins visited her home and played with her children. Another treat was to take them to the restaurants in Moscow. What they loved most was the picnics in the countryside where there was no one around to stare at them. They lived in these old people's homes all their lives and um, eventually the balance between them was redressed, you know, this, this abusive relationship. Dasha um, took, took a stance and it's an, amazingly, and I think that that is an incredible part of the story. She uh, mothered Masha. Nearly 2,000 and essentially Masha had run out of money and she wanted money for the vodka and cigarettes and nice food and stuff. So she said, write a book, we'll sell the book, I'll get some money. Um, but they didn't really know much about their lives at all at that point. They didn't know what had happened to them before they went into the orthopaedic in institute. So I find out that they'd um, been taken from their mother and I interviewed their mother. Their father had died by then, interviewed their brothers. So it was quite interesting. I found out a lot about their past, for, which they didn't know. So that was really surprising to them. It was very well researched, the book, but it wasn't as I would have liked to have written it because it was controlled by Masha. So, you know, she was the editor of the book, which annoyed me because I thought there was a great book in there somewhere. Masha contacted their mother Katya, who was overjoyed to meet them, and she visited them weekly. She told them she loved them. However, after four years, Masha rejected her mother because she was unable to provide a home for the twins. Masha resented the fact that she and her sister had been institutionalized all their lives. I think that they were happy at the end of their lives. They reached this nice balance. But then at 53, Masha had a heart attack one evening. She was taken into hospital and she died in the ambulance. Dasha obviously realised she'd died, but the doctors still lied to them because they didn't want to upset her, so they told her that Masha was still alive, she was still sleeping. It took Dasha 17 hours to die. She'd always been afraid of what would happen when one of them died. She had no idea how she would die. She knew she was going to die, but she didn't know how, so she wanted them to give her an injection to just put her, you know, sedate her at least, but they wouldn't. They wanted to observe how she died. Her heart was still pumping blood to Masha. Masha's wasn't pumping it back, but it was coming back slowly, but with the cadaverous toxins. So she was poisoned. But, but essentially she got blood poisoning and she hemorrhaged into Masha. And I talked to Auntie Nadia who talked to the doctors and she said it wasn't an unpleasant death. She just slipped away. They were cremated because they'd wanted to be cremated. They didn't want scientists dissecting them after they died, they said. Uh, in, in the Novodevichy Cemetery, which is a very kind of prestigious cemetery. After the death of the twins, Juliet rewrote her very moving book about them called The Less You Know, The Sounder You Sleep. The material came from the tape recordings and interviews Juliet had researched for the book that she had created for Masha. It's a tribute to Dasha and written in her voice. I, I just sort of felt I should give Dasha more of a voice somehow. I felt that, you know, it was, she'd had a, quite a sort of tragic life. And she wanted people to realise what it was like to be disabled. I wanted it to be her voice, not my voice at all, not a journalist's voice. I wanted her innocence to come across completely. I wanted the reader to be 
Tasha.